for the sound experience was terrific. <laughs> so can everybody understand? Perfect. Okay, so my name is Adrian. This lovely lady here is Allison. She does all of our video editing while well, she's one of them. Mike also does some. And then the young man over in the back, he is Louis. Um, so we're from a company called Audio Excellence. Uh, our store is in Markham, which is just north of Toronto. We have the best Chinese food. So, you know, this Chinatown over here may be pretty good, but you gotta come to Toronto for real Chinese food. Because they hear this, they're gonna kill me now. Um, so we're, we're here showing the latest products from Daniel Hertz. Uh, many of you may have heard of a, a gentleman called Mark Levinson. He started Mark Levinson, the company, in 1973. Uh, Daniel Hertz was started in about 2006. So um, Mark is certainly known for uh, uh, having developed, together with his team of people, some incredibly good products. Um, and when he started Daniel Hertz, again, it was the same thing, was how do we make the next step forward? You know, how do we continue to push the boundaries? Now, for some people, the boundaries might be, can we hear more detail? Can we hear a bigger image? Can we hear a bigger sound stage? And things like this. For Mark, it's always been a little bit different. And that's because, um, how many of you have ever met, for example, the designers or owners of the high-end audio companies? Have you met anybody? No, except for me. <laughs> so um, I've been very fortunate. I've I've worked with and, and met many of the wonderful designers in our industry. You know, Dan D'Agostino, Mark Levinson, Jeff Rowland, uh, Bill Conrad of Conrad Johnson. Many, many, many of them, and they're all wonderful, very, very smart people who can design wonderful things. What's interesting about Mark is that Mark started his life as a professional engineer, uh, sorry, professional musician. At the age of 18, he was already playing with Sonny Rollins and uh, Chick Corea, you know, Keith Jarrett, Sonny Schmidt, you know, people who are what we consider jazz gods. Like, what, he was playing with the, Paul Blay, he toured with Paul Blay for, you know, anyway, so. Uh, he plays the double bass, he plays the cornet, he plays trumpet, he plays the Italian sarod. I mean, the guy is multi-talented. And so because of his intimate knowledge of live instruments, when he uh, has a product that he wants to introduce, what he's trying to do is recreate the instruments and, more importantly, the musicians behind the instrument. Um, Certainly, the audiophile stuff is important. Certainly, we want to hear the soundstage and all that. That's all part of what's important. But that cannot be the only thing, right? And here's why. Many, many years ago, when my oldest daughter, Sarah, was, I think she was about eight or nine, uh, her school, her class, gave a concert. You know, how many of you are parents? Do you have any kids? And the, have they ever done concerts in school? So you know. So I was so excited. Went to the concert, and she played the recorder. So I'm all excited, right? My kid's gonna play. The band starts, and it was the most incredible, horrible sound I've ever heard in my life, <laughs> right? You have 40 or 50 kids all playing whatever they wanna play, right? This kid over here plays A flat, it's supposed to be B. You know, this kid over here plays D sharp, it doesn't matter, they're all having a great time, but it's the worst sound I've ever heard in my life. And then suddenly, as an audiophile, can't stop myself, my mind went to this thought. What if Dr. Keith Johnson, do you know who Dr. Keith Johnson is? Do you, have you ever heard of a label called Reference Recordings? Reference Recordings records some of the finest sounds uh, that you can buy, classical recordings and so on. Uh, if, you, if you have um, Kobaz or Tidal, just Google reference recordings, you'll see it. And play it, you'll see that the sound is wonderful. And he's the one in charge of all the recording, Dr. Keith Johnson. And I thought, imagine if Dr. Keith Johnson were here recording my daughter's band. It would be the most amazing recording of the worst sound ever, <laughs> right? And that summarizes for me what is wrong with audiophile? We have incredible recordings. You will go over the show this weekend and you will hear the same 10, 12 songs played over and over and over again. And it's all music that is wonderful to demo. You bring your friends over and say, check this out, right? And it's wonderful. But if I said to you, 
You have to stay on the desert island for the next 30 days, 40 days, 50 days. And the only songs you can play are those audiophile recordings over and over. You can never play any, in fact, one year. Over and over, that's all you can play, is the same, same songs, right? Over and over and over again. Not music you care about, but the same audiophile songs, right? I think I would kill myself, <laughs> right? Um, so the difference with somebody like a Mark Levinson and many others as well, but certainly specifically with Mark Levinson, is that he's trying to reproduce what Keith Jarrett what Chick Corea, what Sonny Rollins does when there's magic, when they record it. Do you know the uh, album uh, Friday Night in San Francisco? One of the great albums in my mind. You have three top guitarists. Mm -hmm. And on the album, uh, on the cut Mediterranean, you have Al Di Miola, right? And you have Paco Di Lucia, two greats. And they are having a guitar duo. Right? Uh, Paco Di Lucia is on the left, Aldo Mule is on the right. And they would start, and then Paco goes, Aah. and then Aldo Mule says, my turn. And then he goes, Aah. right? Now Paco goes, ha, you're an amateur. This is me. And then it goes crazy. Now, this is about nine and a half minutes of guitar duels. And the audience is going crazy because they can see this energy dueling between the two of them, right? Now, they're making all kinds of mistakes because this is not a, a concert where they care so much about every note being perfect. They're caring that they can show off. And so they should. And if you listen, you can hear all the notes and all the mistakes, it doesn't matter. Nobody's paying attention. I was so impressed with this particular cut, I immediately went out and bought the studio album, Mediterranean, because I thought, if this is so good, the studio album must be unbelievable. Right? Bought it, immediately played it, and I was stunned at how boring it is. Because now, with no audience participation, with a production engineer saying, okay, you made a mistake, do that again, right? I hear the chair, stop squeaking. Uh, that wasn't so good, let's do it again, right? I don't know about you, after five, six, seven times, I'm just going to play, make sure all the notes are good, and then get out of there. Right? If you listen to the studio recording of Mediterranean and then you listen to Friday Night in San Francisco, you'll be shocked at how completely different the energy level is. Right? So that's what the lightning in the bottle, the one time magic was captured. That's what Daniel Hertz is trying to do, is recapture and replay that magic for you. So having said all of that, I'm going to play you some tracks. I said uh, bad things about audiophile recordings. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean it maybe the way it came out. I will play you a few pieces to show you that, yes, the system can do that. So when your friends come over, you can still play all that stuff. Right? Okay. Um, my friend Lewis loves to play this cut, even though I tell him not to. Um, and the reason I tell him not to is not because it's a bad cut. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's because um, in this store, we play it so much, I'm so sick of it, <laughs> right? I mean, you, you've heard uh, uh, Hell Freezes Over, Eagles, Hotel right. California. How many times have you heard it now? Still right? Have right? <laughs> I can't stand it. So, so throughout the show, you will, I'm sure, hear those cuts at least two, three times. And I remember the first time it came out. I loved it. My God, this is unbelievable. And then after about a month, I hated it because everybody was playing it. So. Lewis and Mike, uh, when I'm not around, they'll play it for customers. So I'm going to play it. Now, the other thing is I'm going to play it at pretty loud levels. And the reason is because the one thing I can recommend for you, if you want to improve your system, you don't have to spend any money. When you play a recording, if it's a voice by herself or her himself, play it at live volumes, what it would sound like. If you're playing a guitar, the guitar should not sound like a huge drum nor should it sound too, too, too soft. Play it at the level that the instrument would sound like. And if you do that, right away, it will sound better. You're not overdriving your room, and your ears are also not compensating for other things. But some of the cuts we're playing are going to be quite loud. This is one of them. So if it bothers you, please close your ears. <laughs>
phenomenal. It was extremely transparent and fast. Before I go any further, I don't think I talked about the equipment, have I? To, to sort of describe what it is? Okay, so we have here the Maria 800 and the Chiara speakers. The Mir um, Daniel Hertz makes two integrated amps. They look identical. In fact, they're based around the same technology. The Maria 350 is a stereo integrated amplifier. It produces 350 watts into 8 ohms and about 500 into 4 ohms. Um, Mark Lemson tells me that's very conservative, but that's what they decided to do. The 800 is actually a four-channel integrated amp so that you can bi-amplify your speakers. So the Chiara in this case is, uh, has a separate signal going to the woofer and a separate signal going to the tweeter. There are no crossover parts inside, so there are, there are no capacitors, no resistors, no inductors. All of that crossover technology is done inside the amplifier. They call it electronic crossover. Um, I'll go into that in a moment. The, um, what makes the, uh, what makes the uh, Maria so unique compared to other integrated amplifiers is that inside there is a microprocessor chip. Um, Mark Levinson started back in the 70s where all you had were class A and class AB amplifiers, right? And so it was using the same technology as everybody else. But as he continued to evolve and develop and, and mature, he realized that perhaps the next stage of evolution or, or revolution, if you will, might have to incorporate uh, a microprocessor doing all the heavy lifting. And so he and his engineering team, together with a um, microprocessing manufacturer, developed this chip, which now they call the Mighty Cat. Inside the building blocks of the Mighty Cat are different capabilities. For example, um, we talked about the electronic crossover. So the Mighty Cat does all of the crossover technology for the speaker. Uh, inside the chip. Uh, it creates the slope, it creates the frequency, uh, it also does the time alignment. So this tweeter uh, it can be time aligned in the digital domain uh, for the best results possible. So that's all done in the chip. Um, there's also something else that the chip does. Um, Daniel Hertz just got a patent called the C-Wave technology. C-Wave standing for continuous wave. Um, when digital first came out, PCM technology first came out, one of the things that Mark Levinson uh, discovered was that it didn't sound somehow as good as his analog master tapes. Um, now, uh, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but Mark, uh, besides being a musician and also uh, uh, heads up electronics companies, also did a lot of recordings and also he did a bunch of remastering as well. Miles Davis's Birth of Cool was remastered by Mark. And so he has all these wonderful 30 inch per second tapes and he was comparing it to the digital and thought somehow digital doesn't sound as good and it somehow felt wrong. And that started this quest for um, knowledge of trying to figure out what is wrong and how can we fix this. Because the world today, it's all digital. And so if he can find out what causes that problem, it could be a licensing technology uh, opportunity. So they just got the patent for it uh, this, this year. I think it was March. Uh, so C-Wave is now patented. What's, what C-Wave, as I understand it, does is it somehow makes digital sound more like analog. It also seems to take, for some people who are stressed out by certain digital, it seems to relax them a bit better. And they've actually done uh, um, uh, research and the, they've uh, sent it into the government, the patent office, and I guess they approved it because they have a patent number now. Um, I think there'll be more information from Daniel Hertz coming out about this in the future. I haven't seen all the results yet. Anyway, that's C-Wave. So all of that in the, is in the uh, um, Mighty Cat chip. Um, let's see what else I can tell you. I think that's it. Uh, the, the speakers, that is an eight inch woofer, a handmade, same with the ribbon tweeter, handmade. Um, the woofer looks like every other 8-inch woofer, but what's interesting is that this has a free air resonance of 27 hertz, which means it can go very low. I'm going to play you a test tone. Uh, the second row will feel and hear it. The back row will definitely feel and hear it. The front is a little bit of um, uh, bass cancellation, so you won't quite feel it, but you'll hear a bit of it. Um, but certainly the, the, the people in the back can, can verify this. So this is 31.5 hertz. Right? 
Huh? You feel and hear it? Yeah, so which is quite uh, interesting considering this is, as I say, just a little 8 inch woofer. And it's not a huge box with transmission line and all this kind of stuff. It's just a tiny little box that most people can accommodate in their home. Anyway, so that is um, the Daniel Hertz products. Um, I'm going to play you a couple more audio file pieces for fun. Um, where is it? Uh, Okay, why don't we do this one? This is uh, Beyonce. Uh, um, I like it because it's Beyonce. Let me hear you say, hey, Miss Carter. Say, hey, Miss Carter. Yeah. I was very impressed. 45 seconds out, wow bass, wow treble, wow uh, center image. It was more than that. Okay, so my, 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 my thing is a good audio system should play even music that you may not necessarily care about, but maybe your significant other does, or maybe your kids do. And you know, I like Beyonce. Because, you know, uh, it's rare that I can play Beyonce on high end audio systems. Last one I'm going to play for you in terms of um, fun stuff. Again, in this case, the people in the middle will hear this. Uh, how many of you know about a technology called Q Sound? Anybody? Q -Sound. Oh, good. <coughs> so back in the 80s, I believe it was the 80s, somebody invented this technology called Q Sound. And what's fascinating about Q Sound is that it gives you surround with only two speakers. As you can see, we have no speakers, only two here. Um, and for whatever reason, nobody's really recorded with Q-Sound except the ones uh, um, uh, amused to death with, uh, what's his name from uh, Pink Floyd? Oh my God, I'm gonna kill him. Gil no, not Gilmore. Uh, Roger, Waters. Roger Waters, thank you. And then Madonna. Uh, this is uh, Madonna's uh, Vogue Q-Sound mix. So again, people right in the middle. You're gonna hear sounds coming from here and then around you. Um, and if you want to experience that later, by all means, guys, switch and, and, and check it out. And if not, go home and dig it up. But make sure that when you, if you have a streaming system, make sure that you look for the Q sound version, because she also has the regular non-Q sound version. So, all right, so let's check this out. <clears throat> what are you looking at? impressed by the coherence of the whole chain of components so uh, what's very impressive about this system there doesn't seem to be a weak point it's they they seem to have worked out every weakest point of their chain of sound so, the, you guys heard it especially the ones in the middle all right so that's Q sound um, now uh, let me play you music that I care about um, music that if you said to me, okay, you are the one that's going on the desert island, right? And you're gonna be stuck on the desert island for the next year, two years, and you have to bring only music that you care about. 
and it has to be able to play through a high-end system. <laughs> so in other words, it has to be enjoyable as well. Not just great music, but also great music that's enjoyable. Um, what would you bring? So um, I was telling the earlier group <coughs> a, a, a few years ago, uh, a sight-impaired client of mine came into the store and said, could you play me Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now? Yeah. Right? So I said, of course. So immediately I played, and he said, no, no, not this one, the 2000 version. I didn't know there was a 2000 version, so I played that and it blew my mind. So I'm going to play you the two comparisons. Uh, she was 23 years old when she released this song. Um, a few years ago, somehow I got this idea. Oh, it, it started during COVID when there was lockdown and I had nothing else to do. So I started researching uh, uh, musicians and music and composers. I was just curious, never had the time to do it. Now I did. So, um, turns out that Joni Mitchell was in a very bad situation at the time she wrote this song. She had given birth to a daughter but had no money, so she had to give up the daughter for adoption. This is Joni Mitchell. You know, we think Joni Mitchell, successful Canadians, you know, well-known all over. There was a time where she had no money, so poor she had to give up the baby daughter for adoption. Um, the father disappeared, the, the father of the baby disappeared. Shortly afterwards, she got married. Unfortunately, that didn't last very long. Um, and so, when the song came out, uh, um, both sides now, I remember when my older sister, Judy, brought this song home and my thought, I was, uh, I don't know, very young, can't remember exactly, but very young, and I thought, what a lovely tune, very poppy, very hummable, you know, you know how when a tune is great you can hum and whistle to it? This was a very hum, I had no idea what the lyrics meant, and had no clue up until much, much, much later. I'll play you that version. And then see, and then we'll play the twenty, uh, the two thousand version, and then and then we'll go into that. say, which I should have, is that this song is about the two sides of love. When you first meet somebody, you fall in love with that person, and your heart beats crazy, you start getting sweats, you can't stop thinking about that person, you want to be with that person all the time. I can see none of you understand what I'm talking about because <laughs> it's like I'm talking to myself. <coughs> right? <coughs> right? Make sense? Yeah, yeah. And then something happens. I don't know, whatever it is that happens, it happens. And suddenly this incredible love, this incredible passion turns into a nightmare, at least for her, right? And that's the other side, both sides now. Um, uh, so that's what the song means. And when I found out, I thought, oh my God, it had nothing to do with the first tune, right? In 2000, she's now 37 years later. She has lived 37 years of life. She has 37 years of more experience, good and bad. She has 37 years of smoking, 37 years of drinking. In fact, the cover shows her with drinking and smoke. Um, she can no longer hit this key, so they lowered the key, right? Um, but regardless, when you listen to this cut, notice how the emotion of that song is completely different. 
You, you now hear the lyrics, you now feel the lyrics, you don't just listen to the music anymore. In fact, the music is almost secondary. It's like watching a great movie and the music just supports the movie. It's not the other way around. This is how it, it comes through for me. You notice what I'm saying, yeah. right? The second interpretation is so much more compelling, at least for me. Um, more yes, because there's so much more gravitas now. There's so much more life. Right? Uh, two last songs, so I don't keep you here the whole day. Um, many years ago, I, I was doing this job out in the suburb of Toronto called Oakville, and I just finished. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. I decided, okay, I'm going to head back to the office. So I go up on the street. It's called Kerr Street. And as I'm driving by, my eyes suddenly see on my left a store that says CDs. And of course, this is many, 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 many years ago when, you know, if I see CDs, I have to stop. <laughs> right? Just like some of us, we see LPs, have to stop. So I immediately parked, ran into the store. Turns out that they sell world music. You know, they, yes, they have the odd popular stuff, but it was all music from all over the world. Never seen it before. I'm flipping through the CDs like a kid in a candy store, and suddenly my eye looks up and I see this poster of this lovely dark-skinned woman. I don't know if she's black or not, I don't know, but dark-skinned, she's naked. That's the reason I looked up. But she's also turned sideways, so you can't see anything. Just all the suggestion, right? And I thought, wow, I have to buy the CD now. <laughs> Bought the CD, went into the car, opened up the disc, popped it into the CD player. Yes, there was such a thing called CD player back then. And my God, the most beautiful voice I had ever heard. And I had no idea what she sang. It was Spanish or Portuguese, I don't speak that language. All I know is it, it brought me to tears. I'm driving and I'm tearing up. No idea what she's singing. And then somehow I lost the CD, as I often do. Many, many, many years later, uh, a couple of about a year ago or so, as going through the walls, and I hear the music as I'm working, and suddenly I hear this voice out of the past. Oh my God, what is that? Right? It triggers this little memory. I ran into the room, opened up the iPad, and there it is. And I had forgotten I knew this, and suddenly it's back. I'm going to play this for you. The uh, song is called Volver Volver. It means apparently return, return. Um, apparently, um, the song is about the lady who is saying to her lover, please come back. Somehow I screwed up, right? Please come back. As I said, I didn't know what it meant, but all those years ago, I knew there was something in her voice that spoke to the heart.
este amor apasionado que anda todo alborotado por volver voy camino a la locura aunque todo me tortura Nos dejamos hace tiempo, pero se llegó el momento de volver. Tú tenías mucha razón. Me muero por volver Y volver, volver, volver A tus brazos otra vez Was that? Good. Did you like it? Okay. One last cut, and then I'll let you go. Um, I really enjoy this particular cut. I, I would listen to it all the time because it's so much fun. Uh, so Bob Marley, back in 1975, did this concert at the Lyceum in UK, and uh, story goes um, that he had a very good friend who was very very poor. So he gave the writing credit to his friend so that the friend would get the money from the music and the residuals and so on, which is very nice of him. Um, the song is uh, No Woman, No Cry. Oh my God. So when I first heard this song, many, many, many years ago, when, when I was a little wee lad, I thought the song meant, if you don't have a woman, you don't have to cry. You know, Just like there is woman power, there is man power, right? I thought that's what it meant. Never knew. As I said, a few years ago, I started researching music. It's okay, you can open the door, let, let some fresh air in. Um, I thought that's what it meant. I, re I researched and then I discovered that what it actually means in the Jamaican language, uh, uh, patois, if you will, or, or that lingo, is that no, woman, don't cry. Right? So in other words, no, full stop, woman, don't cry. In other words, be strong. A woman is strong. A woman has backbone. A woman can do all these things. She doesn't need a man. That's what it means. So, I'm going to play this song for you. Um, it's live. And you can imagine, in this big stadium with all these people who are there for reggae music, you can see the smoke. The people are very happy. <laughs> Very, 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 very happy. And long before Marley starts singing, they're already singing. They're already anticipating the song. And if you listen carefully, you will hear people like me who cannot sing. And they are singing at the top of the lungs in completely different keys, and they don't care, right? And that's why this is such a wonderful song. Anyway, let me play it for you, and I'll leave you with that.
Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Great, thank you for coming. What an experience you had. Oh, so it was uh, really quite, uh, quite spectacular. And I think the uh, most impressive thing was the Mark Levinson uh, recording of uh, a drummer. And just the dynamic range. Like I've never heard anything like that. So I was really quite quite impressed with uh, with that. And actually, Adrian did a super job in terms of explaining explaining the technology and uh, you know kind of uh, the, the history of the, of the company. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.